I do my legwork, I do it thoroughly, and because I do it thoroughly, archaeologists are threatened by it. Is the Bimini Road depicted on the Pierre Reese map? Graham Hancock has claimed so, and that's what we're going to be investigating in this video. If you haven't seen my previous three videos on Graham Hancock's claims regarding the Pierre Reese map, first off, I invite you to check those out, but let me catch you up to speed. This map here is called the Pierre Reese map. It was drawn in 1513 by a man named Pierre Reese from the Ottoman Empire, and it used to be a world map, but today only this piece of what is the Atlantic essentially survives. And Graham Hancock has claimed that this map contains evidence of the existence of an ancient global seafaring civilization back during the last ice age that had advanced technology comparable to what we have today, specifically at least as advanced as we were in the 1800s and maybe even more advanced than we are today in some ways. This is not Graham Hancock's theory, this is the Hapgood hypothesis developed in the 1950s by Charles Hapgood. Graham Hancock is just one of a number of people who have been convinced by this theory, although he does have his own slight variation on it, and actually this claim regarding the Bimney Road is one of those variations. So why does Hancock believe this map shows evidence of this ancient civilization? Well, he points to four features of this map that he says demonstrate so. The first three we've already covered. I'll just recap them real briefly. The first one is the source maps used by Pierre Reese in putting this map together, which he tells us about in the margins of this map. And Hancock claims that Pierre Reese tells us he used very ancient source maps that contained information dating back to the last ice age. The second feature he points to is the accuracy of the map, but mainly longitudinal accuracy, which he claims is too accurate for the technology available at the time this map was made in the early 1500s. Therefore, he argues, Pierre Reese must have had access to a map made by a more advanced civilization. The third feature he points to is this southern landmass down here at the bottom of the map, which Hancock claims is Antarctica as it was during the last ice age. If you'd like to see if these claims hold water or how well they stood up to scrutiny, you can check out those three videos. In this video, we're going to be looking at the fourth feature, which is this island right here, which Hancock believes is the Grand Bahama Banks, as it was during the last ice age. So the Bahamas today are a bunch of small islands, but during the last ice age, sea level was lower and all of the islands of the Bahamas were part of a large island called the Grand Bahama Bank. He further bolsters this argument by arguing that this feature running along this island is the Bimini Road. The Bimini Road is an underwater rock structure off the island of Bimini in the Bahamas, and Hancock believes this is the remnants of an ancient road built by this ancient civilization. Although he does specify that as it pertains to the Pierre Reese map, whether this road is man-made or a natural structure is irrelevant. What really matters is that it shows up above water on a map drawn in the 1500s, and the last time it was above water was during the last ice age. Now I need to preface that I'm not an archeologist or historian or a cartographer, so if I do say anything that's factually inaccurate, please let me know in the comments with citations. All I'm really going to be doing in this video is what I did in the previous three videos, which is to read what's on the map and compare with what Hancock says is on the map. If I need any information that's not readily available on this map, I'm going to be taking it from this book by Gregory McIntosh called The Pierre Reese Map of 1513. This book investigates in detail every corner and every feature of this map, and discusses every theory that's been put forth regarding this map, including the Hapgood hypothesis. In fact, he has an entire chapter in the book devoted to this hypothesis. Now, I don't want to misrepresent what Hancock is claiming, so we're going to let him speak for himself by watching a few clips in which he details his argument. Now, this piece of the map right here comes from a map drawn by Columbus. Pierre Reese tells us so on the map. And I'm like 95% sure that I've seen a clip of Hancock claiming that the reason the Bimini Road shows up on this map by Columbus is that the locals, when he arrived in the New World, must have told him that this road, or that this feature, the Bimini Road, was in fact an ancient road by some ancient civilization. However, search as I may, I have not been able to locate this video. But I'm like 95% sure he said this on the Joe Rogan podcast, or maybe on someone else's podcast, some other interview. Now, maybe I'm not remembering correctly and I actually read it somewhere. If somebody knows where this clip is, please link it in the comments. Okay, enough with the introductions. Let's get to a clip where Hancock 
basically summarizes his argument regarding the map and the Bimini Road. Shown on the Piri Reis map, lying off the east coast of North America, is a large island with a row of megaliths, like a road of megaliths, running up the middle of it. Um, that island is in the exact place of the Grand Bahama Banks. The Bimini Road is exactly where that island is. And the, the, here's the issue. I don't care whether the Bimini Road is natural or man-made. For me, the mystery is that it is shown above water on that map. And the last mm. time it was above water was thousands and thousands of years ago. Okay, so there we have the basic argument. Now we need to check if these actually hold any water. So basically, we're going to have to check four main claims here. The first claim is that the Grand Bahama Banks actually was a large island during the last ice age. The second thing we have to check is that, in fact, this island is located in the right place to be identified with uh, the Grand Bahama Banks. And the third thing we have to check is that it's reasonable to interpret this feature running along the island as a road. The fourth thing we should check is that, in fact, the Bimini Road is a man-made structure, although we're not going to check that because that's not actually relevant to the Pier Reese map. As Hancock says, whether it's man-made or not, he does believe it's man-made, but regardless of that, what's important is that here it shows up above water on a map drawn in 1513. So let's start with the Grand Bahama Banks. Here I have a map of the world during the last ice age, as it was during the last ice age. I used this in a previous video. This map comes from the University of Köln. I assume it's accurate. If you have reason to believe it's not, please let me know in the comments. In white, we have dry land from today. In gray, we have dry land that is today underwater but was above water during the last ice age. And in this uh, bluish gray color, we have ice caps during the last ice age. Now, I can't actually zoom in any further, but if we look where the Bahamas are, uh, here we can go see where the Bahamas are. They're off the coast of Florida right here. So here we have a bunch of islands and surrounded by this shallow sea in this lightish, bluish, greenish color. And if we look on this map, in fact, we do have a large island that has pretty much exactly the same shape of this shallow sea outline. So that does check out. It would appear that, in fact, the Grand Bahama Bank was one large island during the last ice age. So far, so good. The next thing I want to look at is whether it is reasonable to interpret this feature as the Bimini Road. So let's see what Hancock's arguments are for this. While you're watching this clip, this would be a good opportunity to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And if you take a closer look at what Piri Reese drew along the island's spine, it's a series of blocks lined up in a row. Remind you of something? This row looks to me very much like the, the rows of megaliths on the Bimini Road. And this feature here, which is not mountains, it's not how Piri Reese shows mountains, it's something else. So, apart from the location, we see he has two main arguments. One is that it looks like the Bimini Road. Not a very good argument. But the other claim he makes is that this is not mountains because that's not how Piri Reese draws mountains. Now, I think he's arguing this by comparing to other mountains on the Piri Reese map. So, if we take a look here, we have a clear mountain range, almost certainly the Andes, and he's claiming this is how he draws mountains. I'm suspecting this is how what his argument, how his argument goes. Uh, and he says, these are not drawn in the same way. And, well, maybe that's true. I mean, these have more detail and they're bigger, and they have this sort of craggly rock look to them. But overall, they're kind of similar in the sense that there's these sort of pyramidal haystack hump shapes overlapping one another. That's sort of, that's pretty much what we have here. Right off the bat, I'm not sure you can argue that. I mean, these just have more detail, basically. I mean, for one, who says he has to draw all his mountain ranges the same on a given map? He can draw different mountain ranges with different artistic representation. There's no rule that says all mountains must be drawn in the same way. Well, we can start off by comparing to what appear to be mountains in other places on this map. So over here in Africa, it looks like these are supposed to be mountains, and they're drawn in a different style than these ones, and also in a different style than what he's saying is the Bimini Road. So already we see that on the same map, we do have some variation in how he draws mountains, although they both do have this overlapping hump type prototype. 
this here, I'm not sure what it is. It could also be mountains drawn in a slightly different way, but also we have like overlapping humps. And then this over here in Spain is sort of hump shapes as well, overlapping humps. I don't know if it's supposed to be mountains or something else. It's not clear. Could be true that this is not how he draws mountains. How could we know? Well, fortunately, we actually have an entire book of maps drawn by Pierre Ries called the Kitab i Bahri, which means the Book of the Sea. And there are tons of maps in here. So let's take a look at these maps to see how he draws mountains. Let me pull up our Bimni Road here. So here we have a map. Clearly, these are mountains. We've got rivers coming off them. I don't think anyone's going to argue these are not mountains. And that looks very similar to what we have on this island. Uh, in fact, it doesn't even really look like what we have here. It looks much more similar to these mountains or this feature, which he's claiming is the Bimini Road. Overlapping hump shapes. If we go to the next map, it's the same map. See, this is the same map, but drawn in a different artistic style. And we see he's changed slightly how he draws his mountains. But they still have this sort of overlapping hump shape. Let's take a look at a few more maps in here. Uh, here we have some mountains. Again, this shows the same style as the second map we saw. Now we see a third style, but still running with this overlapping hump shape. Here we have what looks almost exactly like what's on uh, this island here. So, and these are definitely mountains. I, I mean, unless you want to make an argument that there's something else, but it looks like mountains to me. Again, we have another map. This looks pretty much exactly like what's on this island. And we can see he draws the same map with two different artistic styles. We haven't seen this style yet. So we do see variation in how he draws mountains, although they all have this sort of overlapping hump shape. And in fact, you can go through all of these maps and you'll see that, I mean, that's pretty similar, almost exactly what we have here. So I encourage you, if you want, you can go check out, just Google this book and go look at these maps for yourself. One thing you will notice is that none of these maps have mountains that look like how he drew the Andes, that look like this. So it would appear that actually this is not how he typically draws mountains. This is exceptional. He's, yeah, he's changed his artistic style a bit for these mountains. And this is actually how he typically draws mountains. So I don't know what Hancock's talking about here. It would appear he is not aware of the existence of this book by Pierre Reese. I do my legwork, I do it thoroughly, and because I do it thoroughly, archaeologists are threatened by it. So I think we've demonstrated that this argument that this is not how he draws mountains simply doesn't hold. This is pretty much exactly how he draws mountains. Next, I want to look at a clip where Hancock discusses why academics don't agree with him that this is the Bimini Road. To this day, archaeologists insist that this underwater formation is just a stretch of fractured beach rock probably formed around 3,000 years ago by natural processes. Unwilling to risk their reputations, few scholars have seriously investigated it. Now notice the dismissive way he's presented this argument. He's portrayed it as if they said, oh, it's just about 3,000 years old, but we don't want to investigate it because we don't want to destroy our reputation. So they never actually looked at it, but just sort of assumed it was 3,000 years old. Notice also, he did not say nobody looked at it. He said few scholars have looked at it. So somebody did investigate it. In fact, there's a paper in which they dated the rocks. They carbon dated the rocks. And yes, Joe Rogan, you can carbon date rocks if they're made of carbon. And even if they're not made of carbon, there are all sorts of other radiometric dating methods that could be used on rocks. In fact, that's how we know how old the Earth is, by radiometrically dating old rocks like space rocks. And actually, in principle, you could radiometrically date any material that contains some unstable radioactive isotopes, which is pretty much all materials. Although in practice, doing so in an accurate manner might not be so straightforward. So in this paper from the University of Miami by Calvert, Introne, and Stipp, uh, there's a bunch of different uh, things that have been dated in here, but the first one is called Bimini Atlantis Series. Carbonate rock samples, so made of carbon, so they were carbon dated, postulated road building material of lost civilization Atlantis. 
All right, so they're specifically dating for the purpose of checking if this Bimini road could possibly be a man-made road from an ancient civilization. So already we see some dishonesty from Hancock claiming that they didn't want to study it. If we continue, dated as whole rock and in separate components of shell material and cement to determine maximum age of road-like formation. So they dated multiple parts of the rocks. Uh, the first three are dates of the rock, and they all give dates of about 3,200 years old. Then we have a sample of the shells. I wish there would have been more than one sample, but oh well. They only have one sample of the shells embedded in the rock, and that's about 3,500 years old. Then they have three samples of the cement binding the whole thing together, which is about 2,800 years old. So it would appear that the rocks formed 3,000 years ago, roughly. Well, this pretty much just kills Hancock's theory. The rocks did not exist prior to 3,000 years ago. That's like the time of the Bronze Age collapse, when the Israelites first show up, Ramses II, around there. Well within our current stretch of civilization. So really, we don't need to go any further. Theory's dead. The rocks did not exist during the last ice age. They would not exist for another 8,000 years after the end of the last ice age. They formed when the Bahamas were already a bunch of islands, when the Grand Bahama Banks had already gone below sea level. And notice how dishonest Hancock is. He's the one who gave the 3,000-year-old date. He's fully aware of this paper. And this is not a new paper. This paper is from the 70s. And yet he completely dismisses this, presenting it as if academics never really studied it, and they weren't even willing to study it out of fear of damaging their reputation. But we think that that was above water at oh, some point. It was, it was definitely above water during the last ice age. <laughs> the Grand Bahama Banks was above water, but there was no Bimini Road there to be above water. The rocks themselves would not form till 8,000 years after it went underwater. Uh, when, it, when it finally went underwater, it may have been as late as eight or 9,000 years ago. And the whole effort of archaeology has been to dismiss the significance of the Bimini Road. How would they dismiss that? Because they dated the rocks, the shells embedded in the rocks, and the cement holding it all together, and found that the rocks themselves did not form till 3,000 years ago, 8,000 years after the last ice age. Case closed. You could not come up with better evidence to disprove this theory if you wanted to. I think it's a man-made structure, but the argument is that it's a kind of beach rock that forms in these blocky formations. Does it? Is that yes, right? beach rock does form in blocky formations, but here I believe that the beach rock has been used as a construction material. Oh, and again, we find him dismissing important facts. Yes, beach rock in its natural state does actually look like this sometime, but he just dismisses that. And he's claiming academics dismiss evidence and are not willing to actually study things out of fear of damaging the reputation, when in fact they did study it and they found evidence completely contradicting your theory and you're dismissing it. I do my legwork, I do it thoroughly, and because I do it thoroughly, archeologists are threatened by it. If you're not convinced at this point by the complete dishonesty of Graham Hancock's methods, especially if you've seen my previous three videos, then I don't know what to tell you. There's really no evidence I could put forth. I can literally take you outside and show you the sky's blue. You're still going to claim it's brown because you want it to be brown. Well, there really isn't a need to go forward because the theory is dead in the water, but let's continue anyways. Next, we want to take a look at the location of the island. Efforts have been made to explain it as a badly drawn map of Cuba. Efforts by who? Notice he doesn't say. Not by academics, because academics do not believe that this is in fact Cuba, or supposed to represent Cuba. The main reason for that is it actually says on the map what this island is. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. The person claiming that this was Cuba is Charles Hapgood. Hancock never takes his information from people who disagree with him. He's only taking information from people who generally agree with him, like Hapgood. But we see here we've got a slight divergence in his beliefs versus Hapgood's. Uh, and that just doesn't fly for me, because you can't get it wrong. Well, it's long and thin and oriented on a different axis. And oriented east-west, whereas this is oriented north-south. Wait a minute. This is a really strange argument made by Hancock here. Uh, you might think on the face of it, well, that's perfectly reasonable. How could this be Cuba? if it's oriented north-south when Cuba is oriented east-west. Well, it's not actually oriented east-west. It's oriented at an angle here, and it does certainly has a north-south component. And why would you assume that you couldn't get it wrong? Columbus just got there. He doesn't know what he's mapping. But what's really strange about this claim is that he's claiming that this cannot be Cuba because it's north-south. But if you've seen my previous videos, 
you'll know that he has claimed that this projection here, this azimuthal equidistant projection centered near Cairo, is precisely, his word, precisely the projection used by Peter Rees in making his map. And if we take a look at this uh, type of projection, north-south is not oriented necessarily vertically, and east-west is not necessarily horizontal. The orientation of north depends on the location on the map. And if we zoom in to where Cuba is, what do we see? It's oriented pretty much exactly vertically, exactly like on the Pier East map. You would think this would be an argument in his favor, but yet he makes the contrary argument. He says, no, Cuba can't be, ver this can't be Cuba because it's vertical, but that would actually agree with his original claim that this is the projection used by Peter Rees. So he's made so many lies, he can't even keep track of his own lies, his own evidence. He doesn't even realize this actually agrees with his own theory, and yet he's arguing against it. Now, we've already shown in the previous videos that it is actually impossible that Peter Rees used this projection or any projection similar to this because this is a Portland style map, and therefore, north-south almost certainly is oriented vertically and east-west horizontally. So yes, despite this, it is true, this argument he makes is valid. How could this be Cuba if it's oriented vertically? But he doesn't realize this contradicts his earlier arguments about this azimuthal equidistant projection. Again, he's made so many lies at this point, he can't even keep track of them. But an island of exactly that size and shape did exist during the last ice age. So now we come to the third argument, which is that this island has the right size and is, in lo and is located exactly at the right place to be the Grand Bahama Banks. So let's investigate that claim. Notice on this map, we don't actually have lines of longitude and latitude, so we're going to have to infer them somehow. Um, if we took it, take a look at the longitude, we see that this island is pretty much right above this part of South America. And that would put it right about here, on this axis about here somewhere. So we can see that east-west already, it's not in the right location. However, given how distorted the map, or the Pier Reese map is at this northern part of South America, that's probably not enough to say it's in the wrong location. Even though, remember that accuracy is one of Hancock's arguments. The map is highly accurate. So you can't just brush aside inaccuracies in longitudinal position because Hancock has argued that the hyper-accurate longitudinal coordinates is one of the things that points to this map being made by a more advanced civilization. They can't be accurate when it suits you, and then when another part of the map doesn't seem to fit your theory, you say, oh, well, it's inaccurate. In this case, though, there is something funny with the longitudinal location, because this part of the map right here, which does not come from Columbus's map, Columbus's map ends here, uh, is very clearly the northern coast of Colombia. If we zoom into Colombia, we can see here we have the Guajira Peninsula, which is right here. And then it continues and we have this sort of block shape right here, which matches what's here with some funny peninsulas jutting out right here. And then a, another peninsula right here leading into a large bay. This bay extends all the way down here, which is exactly what we have here. So this is clearly the northern coast of Colombia, but it's been turned sideways because the northern coast of Colombia should run east-west. By the way, the place names right here uh, identify it with historical region of Panama, which today it's a country, but historically that encompassed Panama and Colombia and Venezuela all as one region. So then why is this part of Colombia turned sideways? Why doesn't he continue? Why did he turn it right here at a 90 degree angle? Well, almost certainly the explanation is he's got a map uh, from someone, I don't know who, for this part of Colombia, and then he's got Columbus's map, and he's trying to piece these two maps together, and he's got to decide which one's correct. And down here, this large text is an ode to how great Columbus is. So he thinks Columbus is the man, so he's probably saying, I'm going to keep Columbus's map, and I got to make this other guy's map match Columbus's map, so he's turned it sideways in order to fit the two together. Because of that, not having the right longitudinal location, not a big deal for identifying this with the, the, uh, the Grand Bahama Banks, even though Hancock has claimed longitude is extremely accurate on this map. Now, how about latitude? Well, if we take the bottom of this island and just scroll directly to the right, 
we get that it lines up about right here off the coast of Morocco. So if we go to the coast of Morocco, that would put us about right here. And if I take a look, that's about 32 and a half degrees north. Okay, so the bottom of the, of the island is 32 and a half degrees north, and the top of the island, if we scroll to the right again, we're right above this uh, jutting out piece of uh, Portugal, which would put us pretty much right here at 40 degrees north. Now, let's see where that corresponds to relative to the Americas. Now, already we've seen that we're probably about here, lined up here off the coast of the Americas, which would put the island here, somewhere here. And 32 degrees north, that's about right here, right at the bottom of the coast of, of South Carolina. And then 40 degrees north is right here, right through the middle of New Jersey. So this island is actually located right here not at all in the right place. And again, you can't say that, oh, it is in the right place, it's just slightly off, it's inaccuracy in the map, because you've argued that the map is hyper accurate already. The Bimini Road is exactly where that island is. No, Hancock, this island is not located exactly where the Bahama Banks are, or the Bimini Road. And this is easily verifiable. I do my legwork, I do it thoroughly, and because I do it thoroughly, archaeologists are threatened by it. Parked off the coast of a truncated Florida is a large, vertically oriented, rectangular island. It doesn't look like anything Columbus should have encountered or drawn. So again, we see that the map is inaccurate when it suits him. He's claiming this is truncated Florida. Well, why is it truncated? If the map is accurate, it shouldn't be truncated. And then he says something strange. He says this doesn't look like anything Columbus should have encountered. That's true. It doesn't look like the Bahamas, which is where Columbus landed, or any of the other Caribbean islands, which he went to later. But as far as something he should have drawn, well, who knows what he should have drawn? He doesn't know where he is. So why would he expect him to draw an accurate map of the Caribbean? Well, let's just read what's written on the map and see if we can figure out what this island is. Here we have some text, and here we have some text, and there's text all around here. So we're going to look at the translations. This is taken from the book by Macintosh. This text right here is translated as El Cizire or El Cizire Isla de España. So El Cizire, probably El Cizire, is a Turkish garbling of the word Al Jazeera in Arabic, which means the island. And clearly Isla de España means island of Spain in Spanish or Latin or whatever language uh, Columbus used on his map. So this says the island of the island of Spain. That's the island of Hispaniola. That is this island right here, where modern day Haiti and Dominican Republic are. This is the island of Hispaniola. So this is not Cuba. It's not the Grand Bahama Banks. It's the island of Hispaniola. And notice that this also tells us that Peter Reese doesn't speak very good Spanish or Latin or whatever language Columbus used because he doesn't realize that this word means island. He's written the island in Arabic slash Turkish and then he thinks Isla de España is the place name, not realizing he's written the island of the island of Spain. Okay, it says the island of Spain, but the Spanish went around conquering lots of places and claiming all of it belonged to Spain. So maybe they named multiple islands in the name of Spain. So let's take a look at a few other place names here. Down here we have a text, and that is transliterated as Paxin Vidad. And in the book he tells us, he argues, well, this is almost certainly the uh, settlement of La Navidad. We see we have the word Navidad written at the end here. La Navidad was the first settlement built by Columbus on the island of Hispaniola. As soon as he left, it was destroyed by the natives, so it would only show up on a map by Columbus. But it was on the island of Hispaniola. Uh, where this Pax part comes in, I don't really know. He doesn't explain in the book. I wish he would tell us how this why maybe this Paxi shows up in front of the name, what that could possibly mean. But he doesn't. If somebody has an idea, maybe you speak Turkish or something, and you know where this might have come from, please uh, let me know in the comments. The third island we're going to look at, or the third name, is this one right here, which is this island here, and this text right here, which says Birbinish. Now apparently, according to Macintosh, in Old Turkish, this translates to Long Cloak. And Macintosh tells us that pretty much 
every historian is in agreement that this actually is a translation of the island Altavelo, which means high sail in Spanish. Now, the island of Altavelo is still called that today, and it is located right here. Isla Altavelo, right beneath the island of Hispaniola. So we got three place names telling us this is the island of Hispaniola. By the way, uh, this is labeled the Virgin Islands, which are not far from the island of Hispaniola as well, right here. And this is Puerto Rico. But this is not from Columbus's map. But it says here there's a settlement called um, San Juan Bautista, which is the modern-day city of San Juan, the capital of Puerto Rico. And the Virgin, Virgin Islands show up twice, here on, the, on one map and then here on the map from Columbus. So we've successfully identified this island as the island of Hispaniola. Now, why doesn't it actually look like the island of Hispaniola? Well, for that, we have to look at where Columbus went. If we take a look at his travels, um, we know that this probably comes from his second voyage. So that would be, here we have four voyages. The second voyage is in red, and the blue one is the first voyage. And remember, he doesn't have this satellite view of a map that we, we get to look at. He can only see literally what's touching this blue line. And if we take a look, he never actually sails all around the island of Hispaniola. He never sails into this large bay here. He doesn't know that it looks like that. Okay, but it's still oriented in the wrong way. So we still have to explain that. Well, before we get to that, let's take a look at what this is. Because if this is Hispaniola, what on earth is this? Well, let's take a look at what he wrote on his map. So first, we're going to take a look at this text right here, which is uh, one of these two. I can't remember which one. And it says, Cav or Cao Punta Orofe, which translate, translates to Punta Ornofe. This Cav or Cao part shows up in numerous places on this map. And every time it refers to a cape, Cabo. He's translating or transliterating uh, the term Cabo into Turkish or Arabic. Turkish in the Arabic alphabet, I should say. Uh, however, in the book, he also argues that this might actually have been Cuba because uh, Ornofe, Orofe is the name the locals, the Taino people, gave to the coast of Cuba. So maybe this Cabo or this Cav was not Cabo, it was Cuba, and Pierre Reese thought Cabo and Cuba are similar and that he, he might have just thought those were the same words. So this tells us we're at the coast of Cuba. And here we have Porta Grande, which very clearly translates to Puerto Grande, which apparently is the name that Columbus gave to the modern-day Guantanamo Bay, also in Cuba. So this is Cuba. This is the island of Hispaniola. Now, other place names on here I didn't translate because even though we can translate them or transliterate them, we don't actually know what they're referring to. The names don't match modern-day names. Now, why then... If this is Hispaniola and Cuba, is it oriented vertically, north-south? That doesn't make any sense. Well, actually, we do have an explanation for this. First thing is, let's read what's written here. This is this island right here, and it's written as one word, Istonasia, which very clearly says, this is in Asia, in Spanish. Columbus believes he's in Asia. He maintained this till the day he died. He believed he landed in Asia. And Pierre's doesn't realize this is what this says. He thinks that's the name of this island. He doesn't realize Istonasia means this is in Asia. But this is going to be why the island or this part of the map is oriented uh, in this funny way. Because he thinks it's in Asia. He's trying to map this onto what he thinks Asia looks like. And in fact, we have uh, letters apparently from a guy who traveled with him named Michele da Cueno. Uh, Cuneo, an Italian guy, I, this page only exists in Italian, but it says uh, that he was a, an Italian navigator who took part in the second voyage to the New World with Christopher Columbus, who was his friend. Apparently, we have some letters by this guy who tells us that Columbus stated that Cuba was part of the mainland. It was a peninsula jutting southwards off of the mainland and that he spent some effort convincing the rest of his sailors that, in fact, it did run north-south. So it would appear that not everyone on his trip was in agreement with him that this island 
which he believed was not an island. He thought it was a peninsula because he never sailed around it. Let me just show you that he never sails around Cuba. So he doesn't know it's an island. He thinks it's a peninsula coming north south. Why does he make an effort to convince everyone on his ship to agree with him that it runs north south? Because he's trying to identify with Asia. Here we have a map or a reconstructed map of what Columbus probably thought the world looked like. He probably had a map looking something like this. So here we see we have a large island running north-south, just like we have here, and this is labeled Sipangu. Sipangu is Japan. Ah, so Japan is Hispaniola. He's trying to identify Japan as Hispaniola. In fact, Columbus tells us this, and we're going to see in a bit that numerous maps identify Hispaniola and Japan as the same island. Then he has Cathay Mangi. This is an old word for China. And coming off of some peninsula jutting out here is a place called Zaiton. Zaiton is modern-day Quanzhou in China. You can see here, Quanzhou was China's major port for foreign traders who knew it as Zaiton. Where is it located? It's located right here. And you can see there is, in fact, a large island next to it, but it's Taiwan. It's not Japan. So this also tells us early Europeans aren't getting the geography of Asia actually correctly. Quanzhou and Taiwan actually lined up uh, latitude-wise with the, the, the Caribbean, but Japan is much further north. So if we go back to this map of how Columbus believed the world looked, uh, we've got another example here. Again, we have Zipangu, Japan, and then we have Zaiton coming off of this peninsula from mainland China or India. Uh, they're kind of named interchangeably at the time. And then we have a bunch of islands down here, Java Major, Java Minor. So they think the world looks like this, and Columbus is trying to map what he discovered with this map of what he thinks Asia looks like. That's why it's oriented this way. And as I said, we have a number of maps from the early 1500s that have this general layout with this peninsula and a large vertical island identifying uh, Japan with the island of Hispaniola. So for example, we have this map right here. If we zoom in, let me go to the other one, it's a little clearer. Here we have the island of Hispaniola and what's clearly a piece of Cuba right here. And then if we took take a look right here, we have Zaiton. This is mainland Asia. It says right here, Tibet. We can go down here and we've got Java Minor, Java Major. So these islands down here. But we have a text here telling us that off the coast of Zaiton is a large island called Sipangu, Japan. So here we have Insula Magna, uh, Valde Dicta Sipangu. This is in Latin, you're gonna have to translate it, but this says there's a large island named Sipangu. And it goes on to tell us that it's full of inhabitants who are idolaters, and that the Spanish like to wait out the winters on this island, and that they call the island Hispaniola. So down here it says, Qua or Quang, Hispani, Spaniola, Vocat, Vocant, Sipangu. So that the Spanish call, vocat, as in vocalize, that the Spanish call uh, Hispaniola. So the Spanish called Sipangu Hispaniola. All right, Hispaniola is the Spanish name for Japan. It says so right here on the map. But they think this is part of Asia, right? They still think they've landed in Asia. Let's take a look at another map. This map is clearly drawn much later because the entirety of the Americas is on it. And notice that Asia is right behind it. So they still think, yeah, okay, this is a new continent, but Asia's right there. You know, we just crossed this narrow land bridge of this new world. We're going to get to Asia. But right here, I can't zoom in any further, unfortunately. So I don't know if you can actually make it out on your screen, but I can barely read that it says Sipangu and then this word hard to read, but I th it looks like it says alias, and then Hispaniola. So Japan, also known as Hispaniola. Let's take a look at a few other maps. Here we have, notice we've got this same sort of jutting out peninsula here, although this does not have any names allowing you to for sure say that this is Asia. But we do have this island, which is clearly Cuba, but it's not labeled as Cuba. It's labeled as the island of Isabella. And here we have island of Hispaniola. This map has, again, the same layout, this jutting out peninsula uh, meeting the island of Isabella. Again, it's not named Cuba. And in this case, it tells us this is terra uh, ulteri incognita. So this is unknown land. So it will appear that this guy is not convinced that this is Asia. He thinks this is a new land. 
Here is another map. Again, we have the same jutting out peninsula, and it tells us here, Terra de Cuba. So here, the mainland is labeled as Cuba, even though Cuba is actually on the map. It's not labeled as Cuba. Here we have Hispaniola again, and it says Terra de Cuba, Asia Parti, so part of Asia. So Cuba is mainland Asia, exactly what Columbus claimed. Here is another map. This one's interesting because it's got this jutting out peninsula blocky shape for China with Sipang Greece, with Japan there, but then it's got the New World with the same shape, calling it Terra de Cuba. So this guy seems to have agreed, yeah, this is not China, but he still gives it the same shape as was given to China. And he's calling the mainland Cuba, even though he's got Cuba on the map, labeled as Isabella, not Cuba. And again, we have Island of Hispaniola here. But you can see in these maps, these early 1500s um, cartographers are confused. What exactly did Columbus find? Is it Asia? Is it not Asia? What does it look like? Is, is Hispaniola also Japan? You know, Columbus claimed till the day he died he landed in Asia and that Hispaniola was Japan. Finally, let's take a look at this last map. Here we have the island of Hispaniola, Insula Hispani, with the island of Cuba next to it, actually labeled as Cuba. So now Cuba is labeled as Cuba, not the mainland. And next to it, we have a large island oriented north-south called Sepangu or Sinpan. So this is Japan. And look what we have running along it. Remind you of something? So there we have it. This is Hispaniola, this is Cuba. Christopher Columbus believed Cuba was mainland China and Hispaniola was Japan. That's why it's oriented in such a weird way. He's trying to match this with the way he believed Asia or, or China looked like, even though his concept of China was also inaccurate. So in summary, this island is not the Grand Bahama Banks as it was during the last Ice Age. It's not even the right location. Given that you've made it this far in the video, I applaud your attention span. Uh, please be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment and maybe share it with a few friends. And be sure to hit the bell to be notified for the release of future videos. Thanks for watching. Hopefully we'll see you in another video. I do my legwork. I do it thoroughly. And because I do it thoroughly, archaeologists are threatened by it.